Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. I'm Francine Lacroix. Over the next 30 minutes will be your guide to the region's 1 trillion euro market in exchange traded funds. Everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. Coronavirus fears batter stock markets. The S&P fastest to ever correction from a record high. ETFs tracking risk assets see a week of heavy outflows. Junk bonds junked. The largest high yield bond ETF joins in on the slump, record recording its biggest ever one day drop. Plus, we'll ask if a smart beta can outperform in a plunging market. We'll discuss the low cost products posing another threat to active managers. First things first, though, let's get started with the sell-off roiling global stocks. Well, this was a week that saw Europe's stocks 600 and the S&P 500 both enter correction territory, down 10% from their highs. And it's not just stocks. ETS focused on riskier assets from junk bonds to oil and other commodities also been hit hard. Well, with a look at this week's flows, here's our Danny Berger. Hi, Danny. Francine, well, I've got FFLO up on the board for us, and this is concentrating on flows into Europe tracking ETFs. So this is both stocks, bonds, whatever asset you think it that's tracking Europe, it saw outflows this week. No surprise, as you said, basically every benchmark in Europe entering a correction, falling 10%. Now, one of the things you might see up there that looks a little bit odd is the inflows into Switzerland. That's actually just one UBS fund, and UBS wealth management tends to be the one making those moves. So that's more of an idiosyncratic synchronic positioning. So don't really take too much sentiment away from that. But beyond that, on the board, you can see nearly half a billion dollars coming out of Europe tracking funds. Italy, one of the interesting ones here, Italy typically doesn't see that much flows. But now we've seen the numbers topping $100 million coming out of ET, uh, Italy tracking ETFs. You'll recall that that's really became the epicenter of the outbreak in Europe. Now, elsewhere, we see the DAX. It's been suffering a lot this week amid the correction. The most of the outflows are coming from the very high beta exporter sensitive Germany stocks. Now, according to Goldman Sachs, the stock 600 has twice as much earning exposure to the coronavirus than U.S. stocks, given its exposure to luxury uh, and those sorts of goods that could really take a consumer hit. So for now, as long as this coronavirus fear is continuing, we're seeing outflows from European tracking ETFs, Francine. Thank you so much, our Danny Berger there with the very latest in the flows. Now let's bring in our guests, Vitaly Kalisnik, Research Affiliates, Director of Research for Europe, and from Bloomberg Intelligence, our very own Athanasios Psorofagis. So thank you both for joining us. Vitaly, let me kick off with you. If you see a sell-off in the markets, are the ETFs actually reacting the way they should? They do. They do. And uh, what we see is a, a big uh, pricing in of coronavirus fears. Uh, and uh, we see that the uh, U.S. equity, for example, which was much more richly priced, uh, is getting a much larger hit. Uh, and uh, e whereas EM, which was probably a little bit cheaper to begin with, saw quite a bit lower hit this week, but uh, with the caveat that they saw a hit previously uh, with um, fears around Iran, uh, around. Uh, Iran, China, and other countries. Um, Athanasios, do you think that, that you know it's been working uh, in the way it should? This is a fragmented. I know a lot of reviewers are familiar with the ETF European market. A lot won't be, but because it's fragmented, is it reacting as violently as you know indices? Uh, so you have to also remember that the ETFs are tracking a basket of stocks or a basket right. of bonds, right? So as those are moving, so is the ETF. But I think this. Moments like this is where the ETF really shows what it can do on the trading side. So when you look at sort of trading volumes, it's it's gonna it's I haven't seen all the data yet, but it's likely going to be a record secondary trading week for ETFs in Europe. And and when you sort of look at how everything is traded, it's been fine, right? So ETFs are built to sort of handle these really big liquidity, uh, you know, these these big liquidity events like we're seeing now. Just a lot of very rapid trading. When we've looked across high yield ETFs, some of the, they all have seemed to be behaving very very calmly. The spreads are still really tight. The premium discount are still really tight. So we haven't seen really anything out of whack this week with, with ETF trading. Um, is there something that could be out of whack in the next coming weeks? Um, no. Uh, so uh, there are no signs of um, liquidity issues uh, and uh, 
basically ETFs are reacting the way they should be. Uh, I think it's all just uh, coming back to the news and to the ETFs reacting to the uh, to the real world. Um, Athanasius, when you look at you know what we see over the week, and because they track, of course, for, you know what's happened, is there a liquidity issue in ETFs, or is there anything that's very proper to the European market that people should be watching out for? I don't want to be alarmist. I'm no, just no, trying to, the, to figure the you know the fault lines. Sure, I think you bring up interesting points, and I think it's always something to be looking out for. Um, but. Um, I, I think everyone is sort of sometimes waiting to see that, hey, the ETF is going gonna, is gonna to trigger this massive. So what I think it's also fair to, to say is it's going to be agnostic of the wrapper. If we're in a situation where there's massive redemptions and high yield funds or whatnot, active is also going to be facing the same issues, right? But I think what ETFs do is because of their secondary volume, they do add this buffer a lot of times. So a lot of times you don't actually have to go and actually sell the underlying yeah. bonds. A lot of the trading is being done on the exchange. Right. So I think this is where... ETFs really can sort of excel and add that extra liquidity buffer that we might other necessarily wouldn't have. Uh, Athanasio, I know in the past you, you, you know, you've always told me that actually this is quite a nascent market, especially compared to the U.S. one and certainly compared to bonds and equities at large. Mm -hmm. Do things like what happened this week m make the appetite for ETFs bigger or smaller? I think bigger. And I think you see it, especially in Europe, with the increase in trading, right? So I think, w it, you know, and, uh, this was really interesting because it's one of the, you know, with the ETF market being a little bit more behind in the U.S. and you see these events like happening this week and you see trading pick up to me that shows that everyone is sort of starting to gravitate more towards the ETF market and the fact that we did see increased trading volumes and increased movement and in flows showing that there is increased usage especially from a tactical perspective so to me I think this is a really interesting time to show that there is picking up interest in the market, especially during um, when, when they, you know, when they need to trade a lot more often, you're yeah. seeing it in the volumes. Uh, do you agree with that, Vitaly? And is, is there a, um, a part in the European ETF market that benefits? Um, so um, again, uh, just because ETF to a large degree are tracking, tracking. what markets are, uh, are doing. Um, so. Uh, in terms of liquidity, uh, at least at this point, we don't see problems. But uh, when looking at the underlyings, uh, we could uh, kind of play out uh, what, what is more likely to react in different ways to, to, to the coronavirus news, for example. Uh, and uh, so from that perspective, uh, probably airlines uh, mm -hmm. or hospitality uh, would be uh, the areas hit the hardest. Mm -hmm. Uh, and at the same time, from the underlying perspective, that would be flight to safety mm -hmm. uh, and uh, interest in the regions or segments of the market, which could react positively, actually, to the news. Uh, great. Thank you both. Now let's discuss something else uh, caught up in the sell-off earlier this week. The largest U.S. high-yield corporate bond ETF saw its biggest ever one-day decrease, reducing its assets by more than 9 percent. Here in Europe, a similar ETF focusing on junk bonds issued by iShares also spent the week tanking. Well, still with us, Vitali and Athan. Athanasios. Athanasios, what does that actually tell us about what the market is looking at? Yeah, very risk off, right? And especially when you see um, these big sell off in high yield, in high yield funds. Uh, and you're seeing in the U.S. too, just massive selling off in the high yield funds, massive redemptions. It's just showing a very risk off tolerance. And you're actually seeing the stuff that, you know, everything was down, but the stuff that was down a little yeah. bit less, um, it's definitely just a very risk off sentiment this week. Um, Vitaly, when you look at, you, you know, what's been sold off quite significantly, we're talking about some of the havens that saw yeah. a bid. Gold, I mean, how big is that market in Europe? Are there gold ETFs? Are there, you know, are, are these kind of havens directly trackable when it comes to ETFs in Europe? Uh, so uh, the, uh, the, there are definitely instruments uh, for uh, for trading gold uh, and trading uh, some of the uh, safer securities. So, uh, and as a result, we saw flight to safety. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in this type of environment, gold, the first thing that comes to mind, uh, bonds um, and uh, linkers to inflation. Yeah. Uh, these are the uh, your basic. Uh, safety haven, right? Uh, but in, in terms of equity, uh, usually U.S. equity it tends to be faring much better. Mm -hmm. uh, but this time uh, it's not. And part of the reason is to degree uh, before uh, this year, um, U.S. equity was priced to perfection. Uh, the CAPE ratio and other valuation metrics for U.S. market are much larger than for the rest of the yeah. world. And, and as a result, uh, U.S. equity does, uh, does no longer serve as a safe haven.
Athanasios, in, on, on the havens, again, are we going to see a lot more haven products because uh, of what we saw? Yeah, I think we could, and I think this is a good time when gold bugs start to really like start shouting. Um, when you actually look at flows this year, the, the biggest flow gatherer in Europe this year is a gold fund. Um, we saw a new Royal Mint product come out uh, last week ago. So I think uh, we'll see probably continuing, eat, you know, continuing innovation. There's always products looking to maybe sidestep some sort of like some sort of really aggressive uh, event like we saw. I think the safe haven, um, the safe haven trip. Another thing to also think about: um, what people do, they end up going to cash, right? They end up going really short-term treasuries. Um, a lot of those products still exist, and they do exist in Europe. And you've seen that flow this week too. They're going into gold. They're going into short-term paper. Um, they're going into maybe some min minval products. Uh, so I think, as I think, just part of the normal product innovation, we're going to continue to always see these types of products come out. Great. Thank you both. Vitaly Kalesnik there from Research Affiliates, Athanasios Psarofagis from Bloomberg Intelligence, and both stay with us. Coming up, could smart beta or beta, if you're transatlantic, outperform in a falling market? Well, smart beta exchange traded products now account for 25% of ETF assets in the U.S. We'll discuss what they are and why they're growing here in Europe. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. Everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. I'm Francine Lacqua. Now let's take a look at the ETFs, which are selling off this week with our European leaderboard. Here's our Danny Berger. Hi, Danny. Hi, Francine. We'll take a look at this board. This is textbook crisis management. What do you want to do when the markets sell off? You go into treasuries, you go into gold. And as fate would have it, look what's on the leaderboard. That's what we've seen investors flock to. According to Martin Malone, this is the kind of trading you want to see. He says the asset manager from Alpha Book. Now you'll also see the UBS uh, Switzerland one up there. Again, I was mentioning earlier earlier in the show that this is a very UBS wealth management specific move so we can disregard that when we're trying to get a read for the sentiment but this again textbook risk off as investors try to figure out where to position in terms of havens as markets sell off over the coronavirus fears now by far the trend was to outflows so switching up the leaderboard looking at the biggest outflows more than one billion dollars left European listed ETFs this week all of the top three funds on here saw a day of record outflows throughout the week so look at Japan and Hokkaido declaring a state of emergency. So clearly some coronavirus fears going on in that region. And then we've been talking about this throughout the show. The flee from junk bonds. We've seen European corporate risk uh, insurance demand really pick up. Uh, investors are concerned about what earnings will look like amid the coronavirus fears. And it's not just U.S. high yield, which of course set a record in terms of outflows, a daily outflow number last week. But we're also seeing European high yield as well. Last week we saw fall an angel bond ETFs also see a lot of outflows. So junk, these sorts of things, certainly taking a hitting. Of course, investors questioning whether the underlying a less liquid asset can handle this. But for now, the market absorbing these outflows, Francine. Thank you so much, Danny Berger. Now, could smart beta or beta, I'm going to take an executive decision, I actually call it the American way, beta. Uh, could smart beta outperform in a falling market? In the U.S., smart beta exchange traded products now account for 25% of ETF assets. Here in Europe, that number is 7%, but growing rapidly with a record $69 billion of assets now invested. While well, smart beta blurs the line between active and passive investing by using screens to pick their components. Let's discuss with, with Vitaly Kalisnik from Research Affiliates and from Bloomberg Intelligence, Athanasios Sarofagis. Athanasios, first of all, um, can you explain exactly what we're talking about and, and some of the more popular ones? Sure. It's a very all-encompassing term. So traditionally, the way we think about the indices are market cap weighted, right? Something like the S&P 500 biggest companies get the biggest weights. Smart beta essentially tries to move away from that. But there's a lot of things that fall into smart beta. It could be factor investing, right, like momentum investing or low vol. Uh, it could be a different way of owning the market. You can equal weight the names versus market cap weighting them. So it's really trying to own the market in a different way outside of just traditional market cap weighting. Um, it, it, when you look at uh, some of you know the catch up that Europe as a whole in terms of the ETF market has to play with the U.S., where are we on this? Yeah, we're still in the very early stages for, for smart beta. Um, 
adoption in the U.S. There's there's a lot of products and a lot of innovation happening from the sponsors. Um, it just seems like the the education around how to use smart beta, how to allocate to it, if you're using factors, how do you build a portfolio around it, I think that's still growing in Europe. And I've definitely seen more and more push from the sponsors to push product and push education along with it. Um, you know, U.S. is just a market that just tends to move a little bit faster and you're seeing a lot more, a lot faster adoption into, into smart beta products. It's growing here and I think we're going to continue to see more and more growth. And I think when you see events like happen this week and you see some of these products that stick out on the smart beta end, I think that's going to draw a lot more attention to these types of products. Okay. How does that, I mean, is it something that you look at also quite extensively, Vitaly? Uh, absolutely. Well, sometimes researchers feel it's escorted as godfathers of smart beta. Uh, and um, what, uh, our view on smart beta uh, is that it's uh, combining probably the best uh, features of both passive and active. Uh, for uh, there are strong benefits for going passive, which are uh, simpli simplicity, transparency, low costs. Low cost means that sh investor tends to get more of the premium uh, than uh, than the asset manager, uh, and at the same time. Uh, you are not investing in cap-weighted benchmark, uh, where today, for example, uh, cap-weighted benchmark um, is dominated by a few uh, very large companies, uh, and, uh, and you're bearing disproportionate risk from that. So, for example, uh, Apple's capitalization today uh, rivals the capitalization of energy sector uh, or the capitalization of Germany. Uh, and. Uh, is that does that make sense? Uh, is that a fair capitalization? Uh, and so, uh, in smart beta, uh, you're avoiding uh, a lot of the same risk. And what you're benefiting from uh, is exposure to known drivers of return, uh, like value, momentum, low beta. Um, the, the big talk, of course, is about active ETFs, Athanasios, as well. Are, are these kind of funds putting, you know, at risk active ones, or at least steal some of their thunder? Yeah, I think that's exactly what they're doing. So not only does active have to compete, which is the ultra low cost that, like, benefit that the ETF has. Now you have these strategies that are being put in the same wrapper. So an active manager that might pick stocks based on these metrics, the ETF has now essentially run that same screen that that manager is running, picking the stocks and offering it in the ETF. So really, active has to go up against not only the cost, but against these type of products, right? And I think as we see more and more product development, I think that this is going to be the real sort of uh, hurdle that active has to has to overcome is going to be these types of strategies. Uh, great. Uh, thank you both. Vitaly Kalesnik there from Research Affiliates, Athanasios Sarofagis from Bloomberg Intelligence. Both stay with us. Coming up, we'll ask if there's anywhere for ETF investors to find shelter when markets are deep in the red. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. Everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. I'm Francine Lachman, London. Now, is there anywhere for ETF investors to find shelter when markets are deep in the red? With a look at that, here's our Danny Berger. Hi, Danny. Hi, Francine. Coronavirus, it continues to push the global economy to its worst performance in over a decade. And investors are looking for havens really beyond just gold and treasuries. The appeal of the so-called stay-at-home stocks are now rising, with people more likely to stay in and play Call of Duty than go see the cinema. Enter Vanex Esports and Video Gaming ETF. These stocks may benefit as people decline to go out and spend money over the COVID-19 fears. Now, the fund's second biggest holding is China's internet giant Tencent. It's outperformed the global stock market by more than six percentage points this week. And the ETF itself, its ticker ESBO, has been able to hold on to a 2% gain this year, despite the broader market falling into the red. And really, it's a general thematic play as well. The esports industry is expected to hit one point eight billion dollars by 2022 data from Newzo shows but according to Stephen Lung from UOB Hong Kong it's time to be more selective he says the positive lift to game developers may be short-lived if we don't see any sort of permanent lockdown Francine thank you so much Danny Berger there with the very latest on some of the gaming and esports things now let's get final thoughts with Vitaly Kalisnik from research affiliates and from Bloomberg intelligence Athanasios Psarofagis Athanasios when you look at you know some of these havens so we talked about gold but is, is there a lack of havens in the ETF market especially in Europe so I would say no because you can always uh, there's so many different areas you can park your money one being like treasuries or cash right there's there's plenty of products there another one could be low vol equities 
there's plenty of products there. Um, definitely on the thematic side, um, you know, this is just not a theme that issuers had thought about tracking, so there's not a lot of like stay at home ETFs or anything like that, but there are probably ways you can play it thematically. One thing to remember, even an allocation to a thematic ETF, it's not going to be massive. You're not going to put everything into a gaming ETF, right? You're likely to maybe put everything more into like a cash, um, a cash type product or a treasury type product. And the other thing is there are volatility type products. So like in the US, any product that tracks the VIX is going to do really well this week. You see flows into it. There are some in Europe. It's just the, the usage rules don't allow for a lot of that here. So there are some of it, but you're not going to see probably as much of those types of products as we do see in the US. Vitaly? Uh, yeah, so uh, I think uh, we've seen already this week that low volatility, um, low beta uh, mm -hmm. equity funds have been doing a lot better than the market. Um, in terms of the uh, themes within equity, uh, probably things that uh, will help productivity uh, without communication, so kind of like Zoom uh, for video conferencing, uh, these type of companies can benefit from this. Um, and, and then obviously uh, the uh, gold and bond type of uh, exposures. Now, having said that, uh, I think investors should be uh, quite careful with currency exposures because currencies tend to be uh, reacting quite sharply uh, in this type of events. So, uh, so it's something that we need to, to something I, we need to pay attention to. I guess. Watch. Um, are, are we going to see a lot more of these kind of ETFs, like Danny was talking about? Uh, thematic types. I think yeah. definitely. Um, thematic is just one of those things that's just. For the issuer standpoint, it, it brings an interesting conversation to the table, right? So when you're going in and talking to a client, you're not talking about MSCI IFA anymore, right? They want to hear some new ideas, bigger mega trends that are happening, uh, demographical changes. So whether it's autonomous vehicles, uh, aging population, internet in emerging emerging markets. So I think we're definitely going to see more and more growth on the thematic side. Also, these products that tend to have higher fees for the issuers they obviously like that too you know it's in a space where fees are so compressed anywhere they can try to have a differentiated product with a little bit of a higher fee is going to obviously be of interest to them uh, very quickly how long does it take to actually manufacture these things it, 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 there's a lot of work that goes on on the back end okay. right you have to work with index providers you have to come up with a strategy you have to test it you have to see that there's market demand for it um, it all depends on you know what type of product the complexity of the product Great, thank you both for joining us. Vitaly Kalesnik, the Research Affiliates Director of Research for Europe, and Athanasios Sarofagis of Bloomberg Intelligence. Well, that's it for this week's Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. This is Bloomberg.